yes, I am very happy to have Linda Bloom with us today. So Linda has more than 45 years of experience with all aspects of exploration and geochemistry. She's recognized as a world expert on assay methods and has traveled extensively worldwide to review sampling and analytical procedures. So with her vast experience, it is going to be an absolute treat hearing from her today about the dirty little secrets of assay quality control. So this is going to be a really fun session. I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, but yes, before we do get stuck into your presentation, uh, firstly, thank you so much for talking to us on GeoHug today. Uh, Great. Yeah. No, we're really happy to be here. It's so good. I was um, curious to know what got you into geochemistry to begin with. Oh, well, you know, um, I went to university and uh, started with uh, taking care of mystery, but it became esoteric really quickly. Um, and you know what? There were some really cute guys uh, taking geology, and they told me that it was a bird course. So I thought, <laughs> that's cool. I'll take a geology course. And then I ended up doing a combined geology chemistry degree for my undergraduate. And uh, then I did a master's at Queen's in actually geochemistry. Um, and it's, you know, um, that's what I've done for, uh, you know, since I graduated in 1980. So it's been a long time. Um, and, and I and I did start dirt bagging. And I did quite a bit of field work. Um, and, and you know, you also have to know that in that time period, there were a lot of periods where there were no work, right? And, and I would just say, I managed to stay in the mining industry by being really flexible and doing, you know, I did sales, I managed a lab, I ran junior mining companies, I was on a variety of boards. And um, when I was lucky enough, um, I got to review some exploration geochem data. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to show you some um, pictures of the labs that I have visited over time. Um, so you can see sort of um, what's evolved a bit um, in the last while. And then uh, we're going to just talk about why we now, which which is really the lead into why are we doing quality control these days? Yeah. Yeah. I do um, usually get speakers to bring along pet rocks, but considering where your expertise is, I believe that you prefer your rocks ground up and dissolved in test tubes. So I was um, wondering if you would take us through a few of those photos that you had of some lab disasters. Be really keen to see a few examples. Sure. Um, so this part of the presentation, I'm going to do quite quickly, just flashing some pictures up. Um, and I, you know, this is called the red flags. I know a lot of people like to visit a lab. Um, that's great. Um, I don't think you always see, you know, sort of what's swept under the carpet. Uh, what I'm going to show you is more what's a little bit more obvious. And, and you know, in, and, and even things like, so when I worked as a lab manager, every once in a while, we would get samples like this. So this is just a reminder, if you're going to send in your, if you went to all that trouble to put the dirt in a bag, Make sure you pack it up so that when it reaches the lab, it's not just one big puddle of mud. That's what this slide is about. Yeah. Um, and so here's a, 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 a type of a pulverizer called a Bico, and it's got two plates that grind together. And I don't know, can I, can you see my um, yeah. mouse? So these two plates rub together. Um, and this is really bad for anything that's got any kind of free gold in it. Uh, we don't see too many of these pulverizers anymore, uh, but this is, you know, I did not too long ago uh, visit a lab in a small town in Northern Ontario. And the guy very proudly told me he just ordered another two new Bicos and, and he said, isn't that great? And I said, well, yeah, you can use them as boat anchors because they're really not good for much else. Um, and then they have these ones uh, I, I saw in a, a lab in the States. And the way this pulverizer works is there's actually a whole series of little uh, smaller pulverizers, so for really pulverizing about 100 grams. Uh, and and that, that can work for a base metal project, but I just couldn't. And so what happens is this is entire device moves off this, uh, I don't know, pulley or something. Anyway, it looked to me like the scariest, least safe way to uh, uh, possibly pulverize rocks. And it just felt to me like the whole thing was going to fly away at any time. Uh, you know, th this is typically how uh, these are more like starting like with sample prep here. So um, this is, you know, a really typical 
jaw crusher. This was a, a Canadian version of, uh, it's called a TM Engineering Rhino. And so you put your sample in the top here, and there are a couple of jaws that bang back and forth. It crushes your rock, and it falls down into this drawer. And this is the drawer from a mine lab from a major mining company. And the problem was they decided not to buy the replacement drawer from the manufacturer. They had one made, but it was a little bit too long. So every time they went to shut it, they smashed the back of it. Whoops. They smashed the back of it until eventually what happens here is, of course, your sample's not safe. <laughs> your sample's falling out the back. Um, and that's not good. Um, and, and this is why I tell people, if you go to a lab, pull out the drawer um, that you see at the, on this uh, crusher. And uh, that would uh, at least make sure that it's not damaged. Uh, this is, you know, still talking about crushing. So I was uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe and they said, uh, yeah, we, we crushed to two millimeters. I said, oh, can I see some of the reject? Because, you know, maybe you want to verify some of these statements. Um, and they said, well, no, we don't save that. But we dump it all in the back of the lab. Oh, okay. Uh, so we went and we looked at the pile. That's This is a picture of the pile of the rejects. Um, but you can see, uh, based on the scale where I used the pen, um, I would say there were crushed margin like one or two centimeters, not two millimeters. Um, and these are the kinds of things you want to keep an eye out for. Uh, sometimes you want to know who's doing your prep. Um, so this is um, this woman. Um, actually, uh, it's it's from um, it's uh, from a Soviet uh, era um, uh, country, um, and apparently she had nowhere to sleep except in the in the lab. And I don't think she was very happy about her job. But um, anyways, it's just sometimes you uh, you go to the lab just to see who's actually uh, working on your samples. Um, this is an example of perhaps reusing fire assay pots a little too often. This is actually from the uh, main lab of, for the um, Geological Survey of India. And this is where they were doing all the check assays for high grade. Um, and you can see that there's possibly a cross contamination from a previous analysis of uh, the samples. These pots for doing the fusions were actually thrown on a pottery wheel. So each one was handmade, and that's why they uh, didn't throw them out very often. You know, you see a fire assay furnace like this, and it's falling down, it's falling apart. So remember the, at the very beginning was red flags, and, and it said run. This is a good time to run. This one, uh, this one really astonished me. So I finished doing the whole uh, lab audit um, in Africa. And we're leaving, and I just said, oh, what's all that black stuff uh, that's piled up there? And they said, oh, that's the coal. And I went, what do you mean that's the coal? So at this time, I mean, and this is a little while ago, they were using coal to fire the fire assay furnaces, not gas, not electricity. And you can just imagine how uneven uh, the temperature was when you're just trying to manage uh, the, uh, the temperature by uh, shoveling in coal. Um, and, and it just always amazes me what you can actually get from visiting a lab. Because uh, it's some things you just don't even think of asking. Um, this is a case where uh, the, uh, it, this is a really old spectrometer. Uh, somebody else uh, provided me with this photo. Um, the lens uh, that was, the optical lens that was part of this instrumentation had broken. So somebody had uh, offered up their eyeglasses um, instead. And I don't know if that would have actually improved the quality of the data analysis. Um, here's a, a picture of a lab from a, a, at a major for a major mine um, mining company's uh, operation, and you can see there's a bit of a acid problem. So, uh, in fact, the ventilation system didn't work very well. This is a fume hood where they were doing a lot of acid digestions, and said, and the acid fumes are quite heavy. Um, so you need a good ventilation system to draw them up and out of the lab. Um, that wasn't working very well. And when I said, what are you going to do about this? They said, we'll replace the front cupboards. That wasn't really the right answer. The problem is not that the cupboards look a little rusty. The problem is that the lab is filling up with um, acidic fumes. Uh, and this is what it looks like from the outside. So you didn't even have to go inside the lab to know that they had some kind of ventilation problem. And the whole thing was just, uh, I don't know, uh, consumed by um, acid fumes. And these are things that, you know, everybody knows. So, I, I mean, you don't have to, you know, anybody walking into the lab would be 
you know, uh, maybe you have to open the door for the jaw crusher. But a lot of these things must have been evident to everybody who uh, was in and out of there. And uh, and that was, you know, you saw a lot of that, maybe not quite as much in the commercial labs. Um, and I still will tell you, I can go to places in the world where I find, you know, very similar circumstances, um, mostly at mine labs. Um, and for some reason, the mine operations don't always focus on what I consider the most important part of the operation, which is the quality of the assays, because that's what drives the entire rest of the decision-making, um, you know, whether it's reconciliations or deciding on ore versus waste, those sorts of very important decisions. So uh, in 1997, we had uh, the BRIEX fraud case. And so do you, can you put out your poll about the BRIEX? So I, I realized that some time ago, um, as I started to introduce quality control to uh, a variety of people, like I used to give talks at university, uh, that <laughs> because uh, a lot of people, um, maybe even on this call, hadn't been born in 1997. And so to assume that everybody knew what BRIEX was, was uh, maybe not appropriate. Uh, so what happened was a junior mining company, oh, lots of people have heard about it, that's great. Um, so, so it was it, it was a Canadian uh, junior based out of Calgary that a project in Indonesia, and they uh, reported that they had lots of samples with gold. In fact, what they had the share price rose to um, uh, at that time two hundred and eighty six dollars. Um, big frenzy on all the gold stocks, and it turns out that they had salted that they had added gold to thirty thousand samples. Now, every other fraud case was usually, you know, somebody would add uh, gold to, you know, a couple of drill holes. The share price would go up 20, 30 percent. Uh, whoever um, had shares would sell out and, and go to some non-extradition uh, country. And, it, and it'd be done, right? But this went on for two years. And uh, majors were uh, fighting over this. They all wanted a piece of it. And... And in, in the end, it was proven to be um, a total fraud. Now, there was some gold, and it was very cleverly done because only, like, when you plotted up the gold-rich samples, that all made sense on a cross-section. So it was definitely uh, organized by someone with a geological background. And nobody ever went to jail for this, uh, which is kind of interesting, uh, although the geologists who had been in charge um, de Guzman uh, did somehow fall out of a helicopter. Uh, the story was uh, that uh, his body was discovered in the jungle. Uh, it wasn't easily uh, identified. Um, animals had eaten the fingers or something. And uh, there were, um, for many years afterwards, there were rumors that he was uh, enjoying the good life with w one or more of his mistresses on a beach somewhere. Um, because of this very embarrassing uh, fraud event, uh, the Canadian Securities Commissions uh, put together uh, a committee that then organized something called National Instrument 43101, which is a technical reporting uh, outline, um, and that um, many countries, you know, now Australia has JORC and South Africa has SAMREC, and, and now there's actually another one which is um, uh, called CRISCO, uh, which is an international attempt to uh, systematize, uh, make them all uh, consistent, uh, so that mostly so that the security regulators can uh, decide uh, what's a valuable project or not. Um, I will say there was also a movie loosely based on the, uh, on the uh, events. Uh, around BRIEX. Um, it's a Matthew McConaughey movie uh, called Gold. Um, I don't think it's a very good movie, and I don't really like Matthew, but it is an interesting take on how exciting it is to make a discovery and then what kind of pressure someone might be under to actually feel uh, that they needed to perpetrate this kind of a fraud. And that's basically uh, just a, you know some ideas about um, some of the things we we saw in labs, some of the things we still see in labs, and why we um, why we do quality control, quite frankly. Now, now that's so the forty three one hundred one at least in Canada has been around for just over twenty years. 
Uh, and there's certainly, um, I think, everybody now is pretty much on board with putting in, um, you know, reference materials, uh, blanks, duplicates. Um, I would say not everybody's as good with reporting it. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And I'm not really talking about dearly little secrets, but these are these are all ideas I want to share with you. Um, sort of some of the you know drilling down on the concepts behind quality control that you may not have thought about before. And and here's a an opportunity for me just to uh, explain to you uh, some of the uh, things I've seen and uh, that I that I want to share with you. So um, the things I still see people struggling with a bit. Well, I mean, there's the whole sort of what's the difference between precision and accuracy. People do throw around the terms indiscriminately. So, and you know, usually you see this um, as a dartboard, right? And so you see an arrow in the middle and that means it's accurate. And if it's the arrows are, or the darts on the dartboard are, are um, outside the middle, then that's the, you have to measure precision. And I got really tired of the dartboard. So I found this other one that, that talks about with kittens and mittens. So. <laughs> um, when the results are accurate, the mittens are all uh, equally spaced. No, my mouse is not really helping here. The the um, all the mittens are equidistant on the right here are equidistant from the paw, and that means that they're accurate. Now you can have results that repeat really well. Um, and so there, on, on the left-hand side, we see an, a kitten who's got uh, four mittens almost overlapping. So those results were really precise, but they aren't accurate. And what we want is the mittens to be on the kitten, so then the results are accurate and precise. So we're going to look a little bit at things like uh, accepted values for the certified reference materials. Uh, there's quite a bit of confusion about when you need a matrix max uh, CRM. Um, insertion rates always comes up. Um, how we assess precision. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about core duplicates. I'm going to make sure that I get a chance to tell you my, uh, I think show you a really strong example of selection bias and why it's important to be aware of that. So, so really the confusion results because the regulations don't give you any of the details about what you need to do for quality control. It just says, and this is in every case, right? Whether it's JORC or SAMRIC or 43101, they all say the assay method must be appropriate, justified, and disclosed. And the most important thing um, really for the technical reports is disclosure. And they, their job, the Securities Commission's job is not necessarily to assess the quality of the work. Uh, sometimes they, they go out that it's really the um, qualified person or the third party reviewing the data that talks about uh, the, the quality of either the underlying data or the way uh, it was um, assessed. But, there, but there's, there's not even a rule about having to use an accredited laboratory. You don't have to use an accredited laboratory. You need to disclose that you did not. Um, and so it really falls on the, the qualified person or the competent person, for example, in Australia, uh, who has to design all of these systems. And one thing people do is they look at sort of an industry best practice, and that's a, a reasonable approach. Uh, there also, though, can be differences for, uh, a, you know, whether what kind of deposit you're working on. Um, what one person does for a gold project is not necessarily what you need to do for a rare earth project. And so we, we end up with some confusion. And even just in the last 20 years, we end up with some practices that not necessarily have been well thought out, but have been applied because it's what everybody else does. Um, there is no reason not to do um, at least control charts uh, for accuracy. And this is where we take the results for a certified reference material or just a reference material and plot it over time. And we, we're looking to see if the results show any uh, drift uh, variation over time um, and their consistency and if they fall within the allowed uh, uh, tolerances. Um, there is a, a free uh, Excel macro uh, that uh, can be used to, to generate control charts for multiple commodities and multiple standards. 
um, once it's set up I'm, and it's, it's a macro that I developed. And so I wouldn't say it's all intuitive, uh, but once it's set up, you can push one button and all the graphs uh, are, are created for you at one time. Uh, so, so when somebody says, you know, well, what, how often should I insert my reference materials or my blanks? Um, you know, one way to do it is to think about what is the industry standard. And so what I did was I, I opened up uh, almost uh, 75 uh, National Instrument 43101 reports where there was some reporting on the, where, you know, it was like an exploration drill program where someone was inserting standards. And, and fundamentally, it's, it's usually one in 20 or one in 25. Um, I did a study in 2009. I repeated it in 2018. Um, it changed somewhat uh, in that uh, there were fewer people that weren't doing it. Uh, one of the things we run into, I, and I'm just sort of now I'm just rolling through all the different aspects that I see people struggling with. So uh, one of the, the things that uh, kept coming up was uh, blanks. So we we often say the blank has to uh, report, um, let's say, less than 10 times detection on it. And I think that's really fair, except what happens is sometimes we're uh, prepping, uh, say, a thousand gram pulp for a sample, but we're only sending in, let's call it 0.15 kil kilos for a blank. So like a tenth of, of the amount. So, so when we get a kick in the blank, it's actually because we've pre-concentrated that, that, um, that, that cleaner, right? So, so the idea is, yes, I might get 50 ppb in my blank, but that would probably only translate if, if it was a contamination event, some kind of sample cross, um, sample cross contamination, that would probably still only be like five ppb in my 1,000 gram sample that I polarized. Uh, so, so some of the labs were starting to push back and say that if you um, are going to have this significant difference between the amount of blank you send in and the amount of sample you polarize, you might have to reconsider what you how you set that upper limit for the uh, uh, the, the upper tolerance for a blank. Uh, we, we often say, okay, so I'm going to insert reference materials, which ones? Now, when we started, there really weren't a lot of commercially available reference materials. More people had to create their own. So, uh, but, you know, subsequently, um, it's become a big business, um, and especially out of Australia, right? Because you have Geostats, and you have Arrayus, and you have Rock Labs. Well, Rock Labs, I think, is uh, Kiwi, actually. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there are a lot to choose from now. So, um, sometimes when you have too many choices, it, it's hard to know where to uh, where to start. Well, one of the places to start, um, if it is, let's say, a, an advanced program, you probably want to think about the following levels. So one is the lower mine cutoff. Now, this is really important. You may not know this for your um, drill program right now, but you can look at what it what what kind of deposit you're targeting and figure that out. Uh, because this is where you're really going to be looking at um, discriminating ore and waste, and you really don't want poor precision um, at this particular uh, concentration level. Um, median value is another good target because that means fit for it, it's going to uh, be a good representation of how the lab performs for half of the samples, or, or you know, at that median value, so that half of the the samples are going to be a lower concentration, half are going to be higher. Um, I like to really uh, target something uh, in a concentration range that triggers a second analytical method. So, for example, if you know the lab does some kind of uh, um, analyzes, uh, say, by AA, um, the, the fire assay solutions from zero to two grams per ton, and then needs to do a dilution to uh, measure higher or 1% copper, and then they do a dilution or a different method, that's a really good place um, to check and see how the lab performs because they may be a little um, uh, overrate their ability to measure at the very top level. Um, and then often, the, you know, a maximum may be at close to what might be the upper cutting limit or uh, where you're going to cap results. Um, and really, you don't need a standard for the very highest grades because they probably all will get cut. And you're probably going to be doing multiple assays to check it anyway. Um, and, and when you're talking about gold, um, and a lot of my work has ended up around gold because it is so hard to get the fire assay right. 
Um, and it's so difficult to get a representative sample. But the reason that fire assay is tricky, and they sometimes say it's more of an art than a science, is because that fusion, the ability to melt the rock and release the gold and then capture it in the molten lead, um, it changes with every the chemistry of every single sample. And this might be the most important slide in this presentation because it tells you that for certain kinds of samples, uh, what kind of a modification you need to make to the flux. And in almost all cases, if you have things like um, higher chromate, um, high sulfides, um, high magnesium, all of these things will lower the uh, resulting gold assay. There's actually very, I, I do another uh, presentation where I look at all the risks associated with fire assay, and there's really very few ways to overestimate the gold in a fire assay. Um, but there's a lot of ways that the gold is not collected in every single one of the something like 20 different steps that's required to uh, manage a, a fire assay. I, where you do need matrix match is if like, because now we're talking a lot about rare earths, right? So if, if you have a commodity that's in a specific mineral that might be difficult to dissolve, I, I'm going to use cassiterite, you know, for tin as an example, you need a standard that has that mineral in it. Um, or some of the um, resistate oxides that are used to, um, you know, for, for rare earth projects. Because if you don't have that particular element, that particular mineral in your reference material, you won't know whether the that mineral is being properly dissolved when you uh, send in your samples. So there really are a lot of cases where you need a matrix matched standard. But my what I like to point out is that for the most part, um, especially if you're doing things like a general lithogeochemistry uh, and you're doing say major oxides, really for the chemistry that's done for those samples, it doesn't matter if it's an andesite or a dacite or a rhyodacite because none of the procedures in the laboratory will change, right? They're just always going to measure out the same amount of, of sample. They're always going to add the same acids. They're going to treat the sample exactly the same. And there really is not much of a difference. Um, the best thing to do is just look at, say, like the silica iron values in that reference material and see if it has any relationship to what you're going to be submitting. Um, the correct limits or standard deviations is actually a real problem, and it's been a problem for 20 years. Um, and the the thing is, you know, as an industry, we're sort of, we accept the, the standard deviations or the tolerances that come with the uh, reference material. I want to show you a few things that impact how we make those, uh, how those um, tolerances are determined. And so they have a better understanding of why it may or may not be working for you. Um, and so acroregia is not the same at every lab. Uh, and so I'm just showing you for one particular uh, Aureus uh, standard reference material. So, so what Arrays does is they provide a data pack. They will show you the results from all the different laboratories that report it. So in this case, there were 24 labs. You'll see that across the bottom, uh, 1 to 24. Um, and then on the y-axis is all the arsenic values. I just happened to pick arsenic. But you can see that you can get values from 280 to 390 ppm. And so it, it very much depends on what Acroregia Digest actually means at each individual laboratory. And they're not all the same. Uh, and these are box and whisker plots. So the, the, the round dots um, are the uh, averages and the uh, extremities are plus or minus two standard deviations. It's just, there's a huge range. So when you get your results back, you may find um, they're all around 280 ppm or they're all at 390 ppm. And you need to have a, some understanding about whether that's acceptable for you, um, because what you're looking for is kind of consistency um, and not necessarily in, in the case of an accurate digest, can you say the standard actually failed, right? As long as that lab is giving you uh, reproducible results. 
Um, but it's not, I mean, the, I think, you know, we need to be monitoring things like arsenic and antimony and mercury uh, for environmental reasons, for geometallurgy, for example. But look at the barium. The barium goes anywhere from 100 to 1,000 ppm. Um, and again, this is more to do with usually because the barite, if the barite is in, uh, in the form of barite, uh, if you have sulfates, it completely changes where the, the elements stay in solution or not. And you'll see there's a number of labs that have results in the 800 to 900 ppm. And there's a bunch that have results that are in the 100 ppm. So there's something different um, at those laboratories about the way they do their acaregia or the way these elements are staying in solution. It makes it very difficult. Now, if you have something that is a total digest, so I, or like say something like fire acid gold, because fire acid gold is supposed to be total gold, right? I, I do this whole fusion method in order to recover all the gold. Well, in that case, you know, here's a, another um, standard and all the results reported for all the labs. It's within plus or minus 5%. And it doesn't look like, you know, there's a group of labs that are low and a group that are high. Um, so, you know, if you're doing something like a four acid digest, you're hoping that um, there's better consistency. Um, if you're doing something like a soluble copper, you will not be able to compare results between labs, and it's very difficult to set a, um, an expected value. I'm going to just re remind you that there is a, a, a guide, an ISO guide for preparation of reference materials. And these, this is in particular is the general and statistical principles for certification. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about some very specific quotes out of this specific guide. And there are, um, I think, Amos, uh, are they called Amos anymore? Um, and Aureus and a few of the other uh, manufacturers are now uh, ISO certified. So what they do is, right, they, they send out multiple packets of the same material uh, to, you know, maybe up to 30 different laboratories. And that's called a collaborative study. We often in the business call it a round robin. Um, and we're asking them to do standardized methods. Well, that's not working really well in the, for the acaricia. Um, And then uh, we, what, and what I like is the, the quote I, I want to draw your attention to is there exists a population of laboratories equally capable to provide results with acceptable accuracy. And we can't be sure about that, um, especially if we're using 30 labs from around the world. Um, so, you know, sometimes if you're doing your own, uh, building your own custom standard, um, and that's fine, uh, just you need to understand a little bit about the stats. Um, and a lot of people are trying to generate rules about how many subsamples they would have to submit to how many labs. Um, again, what I'd like from this quote, it says, if there can be statistically and technically invalid results, you need at least 10 and preferably 15 participants or participating labs. Um, so I don't think we can assume uh, that all the results are necessarily uh, valid. And so we have to go for uh, more part participants. Um, the statistical analysis is a little tricky because it assumes, because we, we use just a, a mean and a standard deviation, it assumes a normal distribution, a bell curve, right? But we really have a very small number of determinations for assuming that. And so sometimes our calculation of the the mean and the standard deviation can be not very valuable. Um, and so again, assigning a single property value is only useful when there is agreement among methods and or laboratories. And that's, for example, why we have a problem with the Acaregia Digest. And you'll find if you use the calculated values of, for the reference materials that have been certified with Acaregia, that there's a really broad uh, standard deviation, <clears throat> sorry, standard deviation because uh, there's such a broad, because of the data is not normally distributed. Uh, the other thing that, that occurs is that, you know, the, the reference material manufacturers send out all these materials to the various labs and they know that they're participating in a round robin. And they know to a certain extent, they're like, I mean, all the results are presented um, on a certificate uh, with anonymously, right? So you don't, you know, it's just lab one, two, three, four, five. You don't know if it was ALS or BV or SGS or somebody else. But the labs know that, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, that they're being essentially tested. 
and they perhaps <laughs> take a little bit more trouble with these reference material certification programs than your samples. You know, for example, you know, ALS in Vancouver is doing over 10,000 samples a day for fire assay gold. So they're not taking, they're not um, examining the, the results um, perhaps as carefully as when they participate in a certification program. Um, and so uh, the manufacturers then are in a situation where if they do get, they, they use these things called a Grubbs or Dixon test, and they'll throw out values that are outside two and a half standard deviations, recalculate the mean and the standard deviations, and continue to throw out these aberrant values. If the outliers are included, the standard deviation will be larger. And so when we when we use these reference materials, we'll have a better chance of uh, the values uh, reported uh, falling within tolerance. So when can you reject the outliers? Well, the problem is if they're a result of lab error, then sure. But sometimes, especially for things like gold or the rare earths, um, you can actually, it's a problem of homogeneity. And so people have run into trouble with their using their standards when they're uh, not homogeneous. But the way the statistics have been generated, uh, they pass. Um, and here's just an example, just to remind you to really check uh, what the standard deviation is, if it makes any sense. This is an actual control chart from a commercial lab, and it shows that the lab was allowed plus or minus 30 percent. Uh, so um, they uh, think that these were zinc values. They could report anything from 7.5 to 13.5 percent zinc. Not much, not much of a quality control there. Um, and this is just a, a slide to remind me to tell you that I think it's really important not just to be monitoring our commodity elements anymore. Everybody wants to do AI and they want to do geometallurgy. And so we're using a lot more elements. You have to start thinking about how you're going to be monitoring many more elements. There are a lot more standards out there now that are certified for multiple elements by different methods. But you really start to need to start uh, doing the uh, the monitoring and, and and understand any shifts. And especially if you change labs, you need to be doing those kinds of uh, checks. So here's a you know a simple uh, control chart uh, for uh, a, a, an array of standard with antimony. Um, certainly, all the values from this lab um, are um, high. Um, doesn't mean that it's um, Anyways, it, it, it just, it, I'm not so worried about them being more than the expected value, but I am very concerned that they seem to show some kind of a, a, a variation, seasonal or otherwise, um, so that the antimony values for this particular standard go anywhere from 35 to 45 ppm. And if you're using something like antimony or arsenic as a, a pathfinder element, this, this could be really significant. Um, so uh, one of the things we do, because we might want to be looking at multiple standards and multiple uh, elements, commodity, um, variety of elements, um, one of the things I'm just going to point out is it's very valuable sometimes to plot something called the Z-score. And the Z-score is the difference the, between the reported value and the expected value divided by the standard deviation. So now we're usually talking about what we would like to see is all the results within three Z scores, within three standard deviations. And this is all related to the distribution of a normal population. And here's a really, like this hasn't happened very often. I happened to get some pycnometry, some density data, uh, which I plotted, it had never been plotted by the company before. Um, and you can see, it was, so I had data for like three years and you can see it, the Z score um, changed uh, by um, up to a factor of three, depending on the time of year. I mean, this is really quite remarkable. And it wasn't a particular standard failing. It was just the method. And it turned out that um, the temperature wasn't controlled well, where these readings were, where this method was being applied. And it was seasonal. And, and this should never have happened. Um, after four Four years, though, it's not like you can go back to the lab and complain and ask them to redo them all, right? Um, okay, that's all accuracy. I'm going to, um, in the next sort of, you know, 15 minutes or so, try and talk about precision. Because we actually are doing a really good job these days with accuracy. 
um, using reference materials and calling the labs on their areas. The labs in really in the last 20 years have really picked up um, you know their 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 pants um, have really improved their internal methods. They don't want to be re redoing um, batches that have failed according to the clients. So they really have put in incredible effort into improving their own internal quality control. Uh, but what we don't do as good a job of is understanding precision sampling, uh, the sampling errors, and in in particular, I'd like to point out that these errors are cumulative. So say you do field duplicates and you say, oh my goodness, my field duplicates, um, you know, my soils, my taking two samples of soils out of the same hole or two samples of blastos, they're, they're uh, you know, the precision is 50%. But you have to remember that you took your, your field sample and you took a duplicate, but each one of those samples were then, let's say, crushed. And that crushed material was then subdivided and a subsample was taken to be pulverized. And then that pulverized sample was again divided. And and some and you know for base metals they take 0.2 grams of material. And then that's what they use to analyze the sample. So we have all these cumulative errors, all these things add up to the error you see in your field duplicate. And on top of that, we add the method precision. So, you know, say for fire assay, most of in, um, once you're sort of more than 50 times detection limit, even the assay method has an error related to it of 7%. And all these things are additive. Um, the other thing we don't do consistently in the industry is report on precision. So there's a really good paper, Stanley and Laurie, so Cliff Stanley, Dave Laurie, and uh, which I refer you to because what, what they said was, listen, there's a lot of different ways of people are reporting. Uh, you know, you can go through a number of different uh, technical reports and you'll find all these, you know, coefficient of variation, relative precision, absolute relative difference, half the absolute. And all these methods are used, but they don't mean the same thing. So when I tell you I've got plus or minus 10% precision um, and you go away and you calculate it a different way, it doesn't mean the same thing. So we're not always having the same conversation. Um, and the other part about reporting on precision is every single method has uh, the precision falls apart as you approach detection limit. The precision increases asymptotically as you report detection as you approach detection limit. And in fact, um, for a chemist. The definition of the detection limit is where I where that precision is worse than 100%. Where well, I, I can't tell the, the signal from the noise anymore. And it does quickly improve, but um, this is just, this was something ALS put together. Um, so for example, if you look at the green line, which is um, gold with a gravimetric finish, the quoted detection limit is 0.05. And it's only when you get to well, really one gram per ton that you get uh, the optimized method precision of about 7%. So when I calculate precision, I have a tendency to try and use CV percent wherever I can. Um, all of these methods are a little sensitive to the, let's call them the outliers. But I also try to look at the precision for different grade ranges, acknowledging that precision naturally changes with respect to uh, the, the method precision and how close those results are to the, to the detection limit. So if I, for these, I mean, this, you know, I often am working on cases where there are large number of samples. So here we have 4,500 lab dupes, um, you know, duplicates of the, of the pulp. And if I look at all the data, if I lump it all together, I would tell you that the overall uh, two standard deviation, two CV percent um, error is 28%. And you'd say, well, that's really awful. Um, but then if I say, you know, but it's, that's not really a good way to describe what's happening. Because when I, when I get to the grade range from two to five PPM, in fact, um, the precision is 9%. And so that most of that is the method error um, and that's not related to subsampling the pulp. It's and and I think you can see that this is a curve failure line. You can see that it um, asymptotically 
um, increases as you approach the detection limit. Um, so I think this is my other poll. Um, this is something I struggle with, um, and this is the idea of core duplicates. So you, you might be doing half core, um, and then the problem is you don't have anything left in the core box. Um, if you do quarter core, then that's not really representative of all the other core sampling you do. So that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And then my problem is it's not really, in my opinion, a quality control procedure. Now, a quality control procedure needs to have defined tolerances, accepted limits. And you can't really give, for almost all projects, except maybe like salt or quartz, uh, you know, high, high silica, um, you probably can't really define an allowed tolerance. It, it can easily be plus or minus 100%. It really depends more on the uh, the geology, it's, it's where the veins are in, in the two halves of the core. Um, and we, you know, we're just going to cut the core um, in a consistent fashion. We're always going to take one half, like the same side, say the left hand side is going to be submitted. Um, and we try not to bias it by selecting the shiny bits. Uh, but we can't really do our typical quality control on it. And, and what if there is a failure? I mean, however you decide you want to, however you think you can define failures, how, what do you do? Um, are you going to go back to the lab and say, well, you didn't do the analysis right? Um, I, I think that's, I, I personally think that um, you do, you do core duplicates um, at the beginning of a project. You understand for the purposes of things like resource estimation, what the variability is what the possible uh, risks are in your interpretations, but to continue doing so for the, you know, say over a 10 year uh, lifespan of a, of a project, I, I don't find it valuable. Um, I think it's very interesting that 20% say they don't do core dupes. I hope you did at some point. Uh, I hope you have somewhere a memo that says, um, this is what our core dupes look like. Um, and and this is a good, I mean, everybody says you need to do core dupes. I've asked the security regulators. They don't think you need to do core dupes. Um, CIM does not say, like the CIM uh, MRMR guidelines doesn't say you need to do core dupes. Um, it's become a practice in the industry. And I think it's a good time to think about, do we need to do that? And, you know, some of these things I'm talking about, you know, it's because we've been doing this now for 20 years. We've been on a learning curve. We've developed some really good best practices. Um, and it's also a good time after 20 years of really having implemented a lot of the, you know, these technical reporting requirements to think about why we're doing things if it really is managing the risk that they were originally intended to. So um, I think we do a lot of measurement of bias. And, and when I say that, I, I see so often, uh, you know, somebody used two different drilling methods. Uh, somebody used two different labs. Uh, we do check assays, uh, right? We're trying to compare um, our primary lab with our check assay lab. Um, maybe we're looking at core duplicates. Uh, we're, uh, maybe we trim drill holes. And, and I see really a lot of people struggling with methods to try and measure this bias and to understand whether the materials really, the, the two data sets, whatever they are, are biased. And the problem is a lot of people use averages and almost all of, and averages are not a robust statistic. They really only work for normal distributions. And we rarely, if ever in geochemical data have normal distributions. You can use scatter plots to better uh, visualize your uh, biases or potential for biases. You can use QQ plots. Um, I often plot relative percent difference graphs. Um, there's also a relative bias versus time graph. Um, you can look at cumulative frequency, by. there's a lot of different ways to analyze uh, uh, the averages, but just please don't use averages. Um, I see it repeatedly in technical reporting and and it's just fundamentally wrong. Um, it's sometimes, it, it actually quite often uh, identifies a bias that doesn't exist. 
Um, and even worse is that somebody will then apply a percentage. They'll say, um, here are the two averages. Uh, they differ by 30% and therefore X is, is wrong or Y is wrong. And it's just a really, really dangerous practice. Uh, so so, let's, uh, so we, we need to think a bit more about how we assess bias, how we visualize bias. You really can't just look at the average of two, da two uh, separate data sets. You at least have to do an XY graph. Um, and then you also have to be thinking a little bit about this problem of selection bias. It's been around for a long time, uh, but not everybody has sort of uh, really thought about when it when it's um, um, <laughs> when it is introduced into their data set. Um, this is a, a problem uh, where, in particular, where you have uh, non homogeneous, like a gold deposit uh, type materials. Uh, it's really apparent uh, the more difficult it is, the more of a nugget effect you have. So I'm going to show you an example from uh, 1997, uh, or sorry, 2007. Um, this is the, oh, I lost the mine name. Sorry. This is the Detour Gold Mine. Um, it has a re uh, recently been purchased by Nico Eagle. The company was purchased. Uh, they have mined 5 million ounces uh, um, since uh, they started in 2013 and now has a estimated mineral resource of 20 million ounces. Um, I was involved with uh, setting up the original quality control program when they drilled this out. And um, the, the program uh, had a lot of quality control in, 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 uh, associated with it. Um, and, and these were the rules, very standard actually. So all, all the drill core samples uh, were done with a fire assay, by fire assay gold on a 50 gram aliquot. The method's called FA50. And if it was greater than five grams per ton on that first analysis, the samples were re-assayed using a metallic fire assay, which is not very popular in um, Australia at all. Um, so I'll take two seconds to explain. So you screen a, a large pulp, um, you end up concentrating the coarse gold. So you now have um, eliminated from the majority of the material, uh, the, um, the possibility, of, you, you've improved the homogeneity. Of, of most of the material by screening out the, the uh, nuggets, the, the coarser material. You analyze everything on the top of the screen. So everything that was coarse gold is assayed. Um, and then you take two assays of the now more homogeneous pulp. And you weight average that and you come up with a final gold value. Um, the other thing we did was that any sample with visible gold was reassayed by the same method, the screen metallics or the fire assay metallics. So first it was done with the regular fire assay with the 50 gram because there was better turnaround time. And then they went back and they did it uh, the second way. So what happens is, sorry, I'm just going to close my door. So what happens is, um, this is, so this is the first time this has been drilled out by a relatively new company. And what we saw was the fire assay, the 50 gram fire assay tended to be higher than the screen fire assay. And in fact, but just not a little bit. I mean, there were twice as many cases, there were 1500 cases where the fire assay was greater than the screen fire assay. And only 800 where it was the other one. And so, you know, so what happened was the third party that was asked to do the techno to do the resource evaluation said, well, we all know the screen fire assays are better than the 50 gram fire assay. And since these fire assays, the 50 gram fire assays came out higher, they're biased, right? It's, it's obvious they're biased. Um, they're wrong, right? So they weren't going to accept any of these assay values. What turns out is that if I can get this to come up. So what happens though, and, and this, when you start looking for this, you find it over and over again. What happened was we, we didn't re-assay any of the samples that were below five grams per ton. 
if we had some of those samples would have reported greater than. We're missing this whole triangle, this whole group of samples that just never got reassayed. Uh, because we had very thorough quality control for the for 50 gram fire assays, uh, we were able to convince the, the third party, the, the consulting group, that they should accept all the fire assays. And also, it turns out because we had done another um, three or 400 samples with both the methods, the fire assay and the screen fire assays, selected on a geological basis. Right, so selected on the basis of the presence of visible gold, there was no bias. So you can't say, oh, this is a problem with the analytical method. It really was a case that if you only pick the high grade samples, higher grade samples to reassay, you're going to end up with a lower bias. And what we all do is we all say the screen fire assays are better than the original 50 gram fire assay, and therefore we will replace the 50 gram fire assay with the screen metallic. And we actually potentially in a lot of projects, we are biasing the, uh, to some extent, uh, we're biasing the data set on the low side by making those uh, replacements. Um, so I, I'm almost done. Um, I think what we, I think what I'm trying to say is after 20 years, we can really maybe think a little bit about adjusting our QC practices for what it was originally intended, which is risk management. Um, and, and, you know, and here's an example. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of risk in, in fire assay because there are these 20 steps for the, in the procedure. Um, and I do this um, um, risk analysis um, for fire assay. And I say, you know, there's lots of opportunity for contamination to mix up samples. Um, and you actually can have a greater tendency to underestimate than overestimate. But the point is, it is a method that's complicated, very manual, and a lot of people involved. Um, and so we really do need to watch very carefully for uh, uh, the quality. I'm going to point out that photon assay, which was introduced in Australia some, uh, you know, about five years ago, and we now have about four labs, maybe five labs in North America offering photon assay. It's different, right? Because what you do is you weigh the sample into a jar, and then the jar gets radiated. And it's all uh, controlled robotically. So my question is, how do you adapt your quality control for uh, a different kind of risk? Uh, and so this is uh, just uh, showing that it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a different process. Um, and I mean, I, I, I am a proponent of, of photon assay in terms of accuracy. I do like the fact that it uh, um, can analyze 450 grams at a time. Um, and it has, uh, it's, it's mostly matrix agnostic. Um, I, I, I have put in here um, a reference to a, a paper that's really quite recent, just from uh, this January. Uh, and it, it was available online. And it does talk about a, a different way of, of thinking about the quality control that you would do for photon assay. Uh, the other one is uh, thinking about uh, this. I find this interesting. So we do a lot of quality control on our drill core, and really one of the, the there's a couple of things that you know I really think are important when you're when you're doing a drill program. One is if there is some kind of consistent bias from analytically right in in the in the process um and we really need to be watching for that um but sample mix-ups when you're when you're talking about reporting um uh, composites you know so we're reporting the average grade were um you know five or you know three or five meters something like that you're compositing a number of different uh, samples together it doesn't really matter if the lab might have switched samples three and four with four and three Right, because you're averaging it. In. That's that's your composite. That's that's what you're going to be reporting to the public. That's what you're going to be using for your resource estimation. But you know what? We do far less quality control when we do some kind of regional uh, sampling program because we feel it's you know it may not be reported to the public. It's it's got to. We don't do the same kind of work. And in fact, when the samples are more widely spaced, each individual sample has a far greater impact. 
And we really should be doing a lot of quality control to uh, uh, reduce the possibility of sample mix-ups, particularly something like, here's an example of stream sediment program. The, the, what I'm trying to show here is if the, the lab, or I guess even in the field, somebody switches the sample, so you go back and you you walk back up a, a stream to check on the anomaly and it's plotting in the wrong place. You don't you don't find the source and you write off that geochemical anomaly, right? You just say, oh, I, I can't explain it. But in fact, it might be just that the sample, the the data um, ended up being plot, plotting in the wrong place. Um, and the next person does the same stream sediment survey they get that anomalous sample in the right place and they find the mine. So it, it's just interesting that we um, put the emphasis on, uh, you know, maybe doing a lot of quality control, uh, really high insertion rates for a drill program because it, it does cost more. Uh, but because of the way we're making decisions when it comes to uh, regional programs, we don't do as much quality control, but we really um, have a lot to um, work on. So you really, the most important thing, if you're doing quality control, and you don't get, uh, you know, you get failures or you have consistent problems with the laboratory, you know, you have to take action. You have to tell the lab you're not happy or you need to change labs. Um, and here's an example from a 43101 in 2021. This is the, the, the table that they provided for reporting on their standards, the certified grade, uh, the certified standard deviation, the failure rates for all of these standards were somewhere between 26 and 85%. How, how can you do a resource estimation and yet still, uh, you know, publicize, put out in your document, this failure rate? I mean, this should never happen. Uh, this should, you know, you should never get this far that you have to publicly uh, report uh, these kinds of failure rates. Um, as soon as you start to have these kinds of problems, obviously some kind of action needed to be taken. And that's that's a problem. I think that a lot of consultants, um, people doing resource estimation find is that they get this this kind of quality control data and, and nobody's ever looked at it. Um, and speaking of quality, so um, I have worked uh, coming out very soon in the Journal of uh, Geochemistry, Exploration and Environmental Analysis, should be a fundamental paper a review of recommended international practices put together with Barry Smee, myself, Dennis Arne, and Dave Heberlein. So some pretty heavy hitters in the quality control business. And then they gave us a preprint of the paper. And can you see what the problem is? Look, they didn't get the, the title right. It's practical applications of quality assurance. So um, yeah, so somehow, uh, yeah, you can still get... Um, the quality people still can't get the quality right. Uh, so I, you know, I've, I've covered a lot of material in a really short amount of time, and I've been talking really fast. And and all I'm doing here is just asking you to think about uh, some of the practices we've accepted, and uh, you know how we how we want to uh, really be be working with those. Um, and if there's anything you might want to change or talk about or um, you know investigate further for yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Your um, yeah, that was worlds of wisdom. So there's heaps of questions coming through the chat. So I think we're gonna have a really good discussion. There's everyone still sitting as attendee. There's heaps of you. Please don't be shy. I'm just gonna start promoting you all up as panelists so that you can chat with Linda directly. And yeah, we'll kick off some discussions. Um, for the lab comparisons, is it always the exact same sample? So the same uniform rock sample, same crush sample, et cetera. That's so what you mean when you're doing check assays? I think this was from quite early at the presentation. So yeah, the lab comparisons. Oh, uh, I think what we're talking about is when I was doing the, uh, showing the results of the, um, oh, sorry, of the, um, the round robin. Yes, uh, the materials are very uh, carefully homogenized and then subsamples are, are sent to um, up to 30 different laboratories. Um, it's, it's not a problem of sample representativity or homogeneity. Um, and in, in particular for things like, um, what did I show, antimony and a few other things, right? I mean, it's just uh, the bearing. I mean, there was up to a thousand PPM. We should be able to get pretty homogeneous materials. It's, it, I don't think that was... Um, the problem, it, it was because it was an accurate digest. Um, if you go back and you look for the same 
um, standard, um, and you looked at the iron, uh, and you looked at other variables, say done by four acids, you would have found you wouldn't have found the same problem. You would have found materials were homogeneous. Yeah. Um. Is there no other sampling mythology to understand variability in a deposit without doing core dupes? So I think you do core dupes and you do um, the analysis, you know, um, in terms of, you know, and you think about uh, the, what you do is you, you look at the, the, the difference between the two, let's call it the two halves of the core in relation to the, um, also the sample prep variability and the analytical method, okay? But the question is, once you have that documented, so so let's say you're doing, um, I don't know, I, I did this, a, a big project for zinc project, and you find that 90% of the time uh, you have, uh, you know, consistent mineralization across the, the, um, the, the drill core, but every once in a while, you have a veinlet of really high sulfites on, that is on one side of the core and not on the other. So all of a sudden, I have a case where I have 5% zinc on one side of the core and zero on the other. Is that a quality control failure? No, that's the nature of the ore. It occurs sometimes as veinlets, and sometimes the veinlets don't cross, we don't get the same... Um, distribution of mineralization on one side of the core or the other. And we need to know that when we're doing resource estimation to, to so that we know, we sometimes that can help us identify how we want to um, build volumes. But my question is, after you have a thousand core duplicates um, and you now understand that's gonna happen some of the time, do you continue collecting the information? And my, my thought is not really. You might want to put in other systems to try and make sure that people aren't, um, that your core techs aren't taking, um, are, aren't necessarily putting the better half of the core in the bag. But there's other ways to do that uh, than just uh, routinely analyzing core duplicates, which is, which is time consuming and expensive and leaves blood in the core box. So, so you can't, I don't think you can ever eliminate core dupes. The question is how, when would you stop? Um, if you encounter a new style of mineralization, if you hit a, you know, um, a, a, a different lithologies, different alterations, you, you would probably do core duplicates again and add it to your database. Yeah. Um... Someone's written about core duplicates. If you would like to know the geological variance in short distance, it can be useful and you add, must add the diameter of the core you want to understand. It's difficult if the mineralization is not homogeneous, like mineralization in scans compared with homogeneous mineralization in disseminated mineralization and all the cases in between. Um, in a copper moly scan case, we determine that the variation in the half core was greater than all the errors added in the preparation and determination steps for the element being tested. So we decided not to do the duplicated on a regular basis. Do you have any comments? Yeah, so so what, what I hear that saying is there are different styles of mineralization and we learned something from doing core duplicates. We learned that some styles of mineralization, we can have more confidence in the assays and in other styles of mineralization, um, where there's more noise around which half of the core we happen to assay, it's more problematic. And we need to know that. The question is, do we need to keep adding to that? Once we once we have this understanding and it's well documented and we have enough cases to support um, our understanding, do we need to keep doing it? Because it, I don't think it's quality control. Quality control means you have set a uh, target expectation, target tolerance. And if there's outside that target, an action needs to happen, right? You need to do some kind of check on it. You need to um, change the method. Uh, we can't change the method at the current time. 
uh, in this industry, we're not going to be submitting whole core anytime soon. That's that's the answer. That that's that's what you would have to uh, move to is if you're not getting good match on your uh, core duplicates, is you would have to say, I'm therefore I'm going to uh, submit whole core. And there are people who are uh, comfortable with that because uh, they say we take enough core photographs, uh, we can take a lot of other core measurements and maybe we shouldn't be doing splitting the core. But there are a lot of people who are not comfortable submitting whole core. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on sample size, i.e. half quarter core? if um, when you're sampling narrow vein gold deposits? Um, well, I mean, I think we always do half core for the samples. Um, and I've never understood why we would do quarter core duplicates. We do quarter core duplicates because uh, somebody wants to leave the other half of the core in the box, but I don't understand the logic. Um, if we are trying to measure the uncertainty around taking a half core as opposed to you know, a half core sample. How does that help to compare two quarter cores? Like it just doesn't. I don't. I don't get the logic. Yeah. Um, how common is it to duplicate the crush sample instead of sending quarter half core? Uh, well, but most of the time, all the commercial labs now, I believe will give you, they, they automatically do one in 50 um, crushed duplicates, right? So you send in a sample, let's just say a five kilo sample of some, some sort, um, and they crush it to, let's hope, something like two millimeters, 90% uh, passing two millimeters, 80%. Um, and then they take, uh, for every 50th sample, for their own internal quality control, right? To make sure that their people aren't messing up. They'll take uh, two splits. Say you're asking for um, 250 gram splits to be pulverized. They'll do it. They'll take two 250 gram splits and pulverize those two separate um, subsamples, and then analyze those two pulverized samples. So that's sort of done for you. It's very you. You need that information in addition to two halves of the core. You you need to understand both to really understand. Uh, where your errors are, uh, because you you may not be able to change uh, from doing a half core to a whole core, but you can do quite a bit um, on the specification for uh, what the crush looks like, for the amount of material that's pulverized, and then finally for the amical method. Unless we know what the errors associated with each one of those steps are, again, because they're all cumulative, then we, we, we can't really make decisions even about whether our field duplicates are uh, optimized. And we shouldn't just be talking about drill core, right? We, we need to be thinking about, you know, taking our C samples and what's representative, um, soil samples, all the other dirt we put in the bag. Yeah, this is great. There are so many thank yous coming through, by the way. I am um, trying to split between the Q&A and the chat and there's um, a lot of grateful people here and lots of cool questions coming through. Um, it's it's interesting because I, I think we've really uh, been... Uh, the reason there's so many questions is we, we really have gotten um, ourselves after two decades in, in a frame of mind where this is quality control. <clears throat> and, and not everybody has stopped. You know, I do this all the time. <laughs> and I keep coming up with these, these questions that, you know, I'm asking myself um, and then trying to justify why we're doing certain things to clients and why it's costing them money and, and how they're handling this. And, you know, we've built up really incredible um, empires <laughs> around databases, quality control. And, um, and then, and then, you know, it's very hard to change that. Yeah. Um, why do- and, and, and I have to say, I mean, I started off by showing you those pictures of some pretty horrific lab uh, situations. Uh, yeah. They still exist out there. I mean, particularly at mine site, mine sites can be horrible, but we still need to be doing quality control. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that you don't, um, you know, that you stop putting in blanks and standards just because I think the labs are doing better. Uh, they make mistakes. There, were, there, there are a lot of humans involved in, in all of these processes and we all make mistakes. And, and I think the labs have put in as many processes as possible to, to catch a lot of those human errors. Um, but people make mistakes. Yeah. 
Um, I have no idea how to say this word, but why do people continue to do signometry? <laughs> um, without yeah. yeah, yeah, without a measure of porosity and moisture, it yeah. means nothing. Yeah. I, I don't know. No, yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, this that was a particular project. Um, I was just surprised. I, I don't know anybody else who um, even had uh, reference materials certified for specific gravity. So, so the question is really uh, use pyknometry on a pulp, right? So, so it's a measure of, spe of density, specific, yeah, specific gravity, uh, but it's on a pulp. So, if there were any pore spaces, well, they've been pulverized away. Um, so it's not the same thing as bulk density, and, and it is really important to separate bulk density from um, pyknometry readings, which are just specific gravity. I mean, it happened to be a case in northern Ontario where there really were, you know, the rocks or whatever, they are 2 billion years old, and there really isn't any porosity, and, and the pyknometry results were probably pretty reasonable. Um, it's also was in a, a mining situation where they've been mining for 50 years. They, they were pretty, you know, they, they pretty much knew what they um uh what what they uh what the you know, that, that you know they 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 had done decades of work on whether the pyknometry uh, was a good representation of bulk density um with what resampling program do you recommend for an acquisition due diligence ooh, ooh. that's a nice question thank I you love that one <laughs> what we do is we go in and we find the best core and we resample the best core and guess what happens? We end up having a series, we often end up, uh, well, especially for a gold project, uh, we often end up with um, lower assays for our check assays for those, for, those uh, for that resampling program because of that selection bias thing. It's really interesting. It happens over and over again. And then there's this whole discussion about um, who falsified which results. And yeah, I, I've been on court cases about that stuff. Um, so um, I think the tr what the trick was for detour, and I didn't really show what the what the solution was. The solution was um, not to pick sam not to well in that case it was don't reassay for the screen fire assay on the basis of the first assay, or in this case, what the assay was for that particular you know say you go back and you're gonna you're doing some kind of um, uh, project evaluation, you don't just go back and sample the, um, you know, th there was a there was a five meter section of mineralization. You don't go and sample that half meter sample that was the highest value. You need to take the entire mineralized zone and, and analyze all of that to see what kind of variability there is and to get some uh, confidence in your ability to uh, see those uh, assays repeated. But but it it's it is a pretty constant problem um, on how you sample. Um, you know you you want to make sure that the mineralization is mineral is is there right. So what you do is you have a tendency to go and and, and resample the highest grade uh, core that you can find. And and that may not be the only um, the only thing to look at. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um. In your opinion, course reject duplicates are an important component of a robust QAQC program. Are there programs where they shouldn't be used? Course reject duplicates. Well, I know there are companies that still go out there and make their, like, so they'll tell the lab we want uh, course duplicates on these specific samples. I'm, I'm happily, I'm actually happy to use the ones that are reported I guess automatically. I, I suppose you could you could say that the labs could be, um, you know, I'm talking about the commercial labs that provide that data. They could be, um, I don't know, we want to say, uh, doctoring or or only showing you the best results of that. Um, but but I think the the reason for doing the course reject duplicates is not again not necessarily to fail anything, but to understand the process and if there's ways to uh, re. Um, improve the precision, improve the representativity of the samples uh, by making changes to your um, sample preparation methods. Um, 
So um, I, I think course rejects are, are important um, in order to understand. Um, also, you know, just um, splitting the sam splitting the course reject, um, you know, if it's not done with a rotary splitter. So now a lot of the, um, of, you know, anyways, a lot of the the uh, the uh, crushers now have built-in rotary splitters and, the, and they it's automated. But if any lab is still using ripple splitters to create that, uh, that subsample that then gets pulverized, it's really manual. It's a lot of work and it's really easy for the night shift to want to improve productivity by not doing it properly. So, so it is a good way to, to, to monitor, uh, you know, it, it, that's where I think quality control is important. Um, if there are steps in the procedure where, um, you know, there's a risk that it's not being done properly. But that's where you really want to collect this data and, and analyze it pretty, pretty carefully. Yeah. Um, on QAQC, on grade control programs, is there a technical justification for increased insertion rates up to 25%? <clears throat> okay, that sounds like some kind of a major company that has putting in QC at 25%. Um, it's, I find grade control a really interesting uh, question. Um, and, and part of the reason is it's all happening so fast, right? So, I mean, if, if you suppose you, you're you putting in, um, I don't know why you would do one in one in four samples would be QC, but, you know, but let's say you're doing some kind of quality control, you're putting in some kind of, you know, standards with your blast hole samples. The problem is you're usually taking action on those blast hole results before you would ever have a chance to tell the lab there was a failure and to ask them to repeat the analysis. Like it's a really interesting question what to do in a production scenario. Um, and, and I think it's very difficult to do quality control on a batch basis, you know, when the lab is reporting, uh, supposed to report within 24 hours and you're making production decisions within, I don't know, six hours of receiving the results. Um, so, so sometimes it, it, it's, it's, um, you know, uh, you have to step back a little bit and think about ways of monitoring these things over slightly longer time frames. Um, and so you, cause you may not be able to take action on a batch to batch basis. Yeah. Um, and also if you want to talk to me about doing uh, quality control on things like cha underground channel samples and muck samples, don't talk to me because the sampling, the sample is such poor quality <laughs> and is so rarely representative of anything. I don't know why you bother doing any quality control, but that's just me. Love that. So it's, it's, for me, it's different. So, so say, so, you know, some, uh, some minds use a reverse circulation for their grade control, right? So you're doing it all in advance and you've got a week or more, right? To, to, to get the results uh, modified. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, for things like your, um, your long range model, your, your, you know, the original drill core to have really good quality control and have great confidence in those assays. Cause sometimes those assays are used in models for decades. Right, yeah. those assays are going to stick around for a long, long time. You might sell the project. You might <laughs> all kinds of things might happen. Maybe before it even goes into production. I, I really think having high quality, well, having at least a minimal risk and very good confidence in those uh, diamond drill core, or, or whether you've been using RC, uh, anything that goes into your resource model for me, because it's really long, potentially very long term. And, and you really want to have all the metadata to go with it. Um, yeah, you really want to have good confidence in those results. It's and, and great control. It's 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 really interesting. Um, it depends on um, how the data are used, um, how many samples, you know, I'm thinking of uh, open pit, you know, so in a blast hole model, uh, how many blast hole samples are usually in the polygon that defines the uh, the ore polygon versus waste. I mean, there's a lot of variables. Um, and, and the best way to figure out what kind of quality control you need is to actually do some simulations, right? So, so take, take a, you know, a typical bench and then add plus or minus 20%, add plus or minus 50% um, and see, see how that might have changed the decisions of uh, what's over on waste and, and how it would have potentially impacted uh, profit. In the meantime, I'm just going to put Linda's LinkedIn profile in the chat.
if anyone wants to continue, I was not expecting this to any questions in general. It's very cool. Um, please continue the discussions after this. Um, I'll just try and pick a few more. Um, with the stream sediment example at the end, ah, why yeah. would ink in CRM numbers have assisted when the issue was a spatial mistake? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. And and that's why um except that uh you know if you if you had a CRM um and it didn't show up in the right place, right? So you know you did a CRM every 10 samples. If you um if you had um if your CRM, you you knew your CRM was supposed to be sample number 10, and the results for sample number nine look more like your CRM than it was in the wrong place. I mean, it it, it can help, right? Uh, your you know your dupes, your blanks, your your CRMs. You can just see if hopefully it would give you some indication that there was a batch where there were some sample potential sample mix-ups. Yeah. If you use a CRM, let's say a blank, and you know the analytical method used and the measured analytics in the CRM. Would it be legible to measure that same CRM with a different analytical method and include those values in the QAQC review? No. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, the CRMs, uh, a lot of CRMs now are, um, you know, they'll provide, a, um, you know, some XR, uh, um, some values uh, determined by, uh, cer certified values determined by XRF, uh, for acid, uh, sometimes the sodium peroxide fusion. So you, yeah, you really do need to match your the analytical method you're using with the analytical method used for the certification program. It doesn't work otherwise. Yeah. Um, one of them here, you haven't really mentioned the importance of the relationship between mineralization grain size, example, mm -hmm. the nugget effect versus results coming from QAQC. Do you have a view on doing sampling nomograms to help assess QAQC? Hmm. I guess I would to assess QAQC. I guess you could use it to assess whether your your expectations are realistic. I'm not sure. I I yeah, I mean, I do. I the whole sort of, um, you know, whether you call it a G sampling or you know PRG. Um, I mean, all that stuff is really important. I, I think really understanding uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the deportment of of you know um, the the mineralization and and how it's uh, uh, either the grain size or the the actual minerals um, that are uh, representative of the uh, commodity. Are really important, and and it can definitely impact your decisions, like how much money you're willing to spend on sample prep, right? You know, because it's going to cost you more money to get the sample crushed finer. It's going to cost you more money to do a larger pulp. Um, you might, you know, be looking at uh, paying a bit more money. Well, you know, say for doing a photon assay versus a fifty gram fire assay. Oh, they're actually quite. Not a dissimilar price, but but the point is, yeah. I mean, so yeah. So if you do a nomogram based on the data you have for the method you're using, and you decide that you're just not getting uh, the confidence you want in your assays, then you have to change how you're doing the method. But I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not. May, I may not have understood the question. Um, I'm so sorry, everyone. I've been just picking questions at random, but we are definitely running out of time now. So please reach out to Linda um, after this and yeah, carry on any of the discussions, but it's been amazing to see so much interest in this session. So I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Um, final question. When is your new paper being published? Oh, um, as far as I, so we got the, whatever they call it, the, the first pass of the manuscript with the wrong title. Uh, with the the typo in the title yeah um, as far as i know like it could be the next issue you know so soon yeah awesome that's it brilliant well yeah thank you 
so so much i hope you have thanks a everybody for being engaged. engaged that's great yeah it's been amazing so thank you so much for talking to us there's been yeah an overwhelming amount of thank yous coming through so everyone's loved hearing from you today so yeah thank you for spending this time with us i really appreciate it Thank <sighs> you.